Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 7. The Bible says, How be it we speak the wisdom of God among them that are perfect? The word therefore perfect is mature. Somebody say mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught or nothing. The word there is not. Not means nothing. You understand? Now, I want you to also note as I continue here that this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. He's giving them a certain understanding. In fact, later he elucidates in 4.4 and he tells them that Satan is the god of this world. You understand? Uh, the Bible says he has blinded the minds of them which believe not least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. When he's telling the Corinthians that Satan is the god of this world, when we're talking about the princes and rulers of this world, we're talking about Satan and his cohorts. If there should be any operation in humanity, that operation in humanity is to the intent that they yield to the principalities and powers and princes of this world. So when talking about the princes of this world, they're not talking about the physical princes, they're talking about the spiritual cohorts of the devil. Somebody shout hallelujah. So let's go back to what we're reading. He said, how did we speak this wisdom to them which are perfect? And he says, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to nothing. Or not. That means the wisdom of this world comes to nothing eventually. You understand? Let me give you an example. Education is the wisdom of this world. I'm not saying it's useless. I'm only saying that eventually it has an end. Isn't it? If you can invest countless hours in reading for exams and revising your books so you excel, how can you not read the Word of God? How come you don't get the Bible and read it for yourself? If the wisdom of this world is brought to nothing, why don't you invest in the wisdom which will not have an end, which is the wisdom of God? It's worth investing. It's worth sitting into. It's worth listening. You get your CDs. You put them in the car, your flash on your computer, whatever it is. Some of you have you know, um, uh, been transposed by the Spirit to different places of blessing where you have, uh, you know, I, they call them iPods or something like that. You, you get your word in and you allow it to sink in your spirit. Why do I say so? Because this is the wisdom, he says, that has no end. Hallelujah. He says we will speak this wisdom to them which are mature. It's not the spirit of the wisdom of the world because the wisdom of the princes of this world is brought to nothing. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Now, we continue to say, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of God, which God ordained before the world and to our glory. That means there is wisdom God sets before the world begins. And he says, this I have put for your glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. So our glory is in the wisdom of God. Tell your neighbor, my glory is in the wisdom of God. Yes. If I flow in the wisdom of God, the glory of God is upon my life. If God has told you that his glory is in his wisdom, if you don't pursue wisdom, how are you going to move in the glory of God? You see that question? But we're going to go a bit deeper here. But when he says we speak, verse 7, the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world and to our glory, 
Now he puts a full colon there, right? The next verse is of a full colon. That means that next verse is referring to us the wisdom of God which is ordained before the world and to our glory. The authenticity of his plan that was ordained way before life, time, space, and all these quantums were defined before the existence of everything that you see. It was in the mind of God. What I'm going to read after was in the mind of God before. It wasn't a surprise. Okay? Now the next Bible says, which none of the princes of this world knew. Right? For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Are you hearing me? Give me the message of that verse 8. He says, which the experts of our day have a clue about what this eternal plan is. They didn't understand this wisdom, he says. That wisdom, they did not understand it. It was hidden before and, and founded before the foundations of the world, before everything you see physically existed. This wisdom existed. And as this wisdom exists, he says, it was existing for our glory. And the princes of this world, the experts of our day they haven't a clue about what this eternal plan is that means god had a plan eternally had they known probably had the bible says they wouldn't have killed the master of the god designed life on a cross on a cross the bible says they would not have killed the master of the god designed life on a cross they would not have killed him on a cross they would not have killed him on a cross. That does not mean that they would spare him anyway. Paul knows Jesus was not going to be spared. Jesus knew that he was not going to be spared. We are not saying that they should not have killed him because it was the mind of God to shed his blood for you and I. Revelation calls him the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. The mind and plan of the slave of the Son of God was before the foundations of the world. The Bible says his life was not taken. It was given. He gave it. Are you following me? Interestingly, in this verse, Paul is not talking about the death of Christ per se, to say that if they had had this wisdom, they would not have killed Christ. Nah, -uh. read the word again in the message. He says they would not have killed a master of the God-designed life on a cross. They would have killed him another way, but not on a cross. Did you understand what I just said? They would have killed him another way. If they knew this wisdom, if they knew the wisdom of the cross, they would have killed Jesus another way. They would have poisoned him. They would have stoned him. They would have hit a tree in his chest. You understand what I'm saying? But are you following what I'm saying? The message Bible tells you, beautiful. They would not have killed the master of the God-designed life on a cross. If they had this wisdom, it didn't mean they would spare him. Many people think they would spare him. Satan cannot spare the God-designed life. He will attack it. The only difference here is it's above his attacks. It's like you living a life of Christianity and you think Satan won't attack you. Uh-uh, he must attack you. The only difference is that it won't touch you. Yes, that's why you have the shield of faith. To what? To quench the what? The fiery depths of the enemy. And what is that? It says faith. 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 He sends it you. Neutralize it. He sends it you. Neutralize it. He sends it you. Boomerang it. Boom. It goes back to him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But the attacks are there. Because he does not know how to deal with the God designed life. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I carry the life of God. Designed. Say it again, I carry the life of God designed. So, if they had known this wisdom, which we speak to them which are mature, perfect day is mature, 
they would not have crucified him. They would have buried him alive. They would have poisoned him, like I said. They would have beaten him to death and pulp. They would have stoned him. They would have burnt him to stake, whatever it is, but they would not have crucified him. That means that there is a wisdom in the crucifixion. There is a wisdom in the cross. There is a revelation in that cross that they knew not. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah again. There is a revelation in that cross. If they had that revelation, they would have killed him another way. But the fool didn't see it. He didn't have that wisdom. Hallelujah. And it fell into the trap of putting the Son of God on a cross. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah again. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 22. The Bible says, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Hallelujah. But we preach, tell your neighbor, we preach, Christ crucified. Do you hear that? Paul is saying, we preach Christ, and the central theme is his crucifixion. Not just his death or his killing. But the means by which he dies. We preach him in the revelation of the means with which he dies. Not just in the fact and reality that he dies. But in the means with which he dies. Oh glory to God. Hallelujah. And to the Jews it becomes a stumbling block. Underline that. And then to the Greeks it becomes foolishness. And I'm going to show you why to the Jews it becomes a stumbling block to the Jew. Hallelujah. And to the Greek it says, it's foolishness. But, the next verse says, and to them which are called both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. He is the power of God and the wisdom of God. To you who are called. Are you called? Christ is your power and is your wisdom. But we honor the means. Because the means, the crucifixion, is what makes him a stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the Greek. It's not his death only. It's the means of his death that bring the question of foolishness to the man who understands philosophy, the Greek, and to the man who understands by the sign, a stumbling block. Somebody shout hallelujah. And I'll prove it in scripture again, First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of what? Least, least the cross. You understand? Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He, he didn't say, lest the gospel of Christ. He again used the same word, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Lest the cross of Christ. Lest the cross of Christ. Meaning, the cross of Christ reveals his wisdom. Because to us is the wisdom and the power of God. The cross of Christ reveals his wisdom, ain't it? First Corinthians, again he's talking to them. Let's continue in the verses 18. Yes, very, very 18. For the preaching of the cross, listen, is to them that perish foolishness. Hallelujah. But unto us which are saved by it is the power of God. You see, you see, you see, you see, you see, the, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the cross to the Greek, it is foolishness. But unto us it is the power of God. Before in the earlier verses, he says, I have to preach with the wisdom of God, lest the cross should be made of manifest. That means the preaching of the cross reveals the wisdom and the power of the gospel. Who has understood what I just said? The wisdom of God, the power of God, is in the revelation of the cross. It's in the revelation of the cross. Had he died by stoning, had he died 
by maiming? Would he be put before a wild animals to maul him or a crazy beasts to eat him up? The revelation of his power and his wisdom would have been cut short. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross is the revelation of his power and his wisdom. That means if you have not understood the cross, why he dies on the cross, if you do not understand the means of his death and only proclaim his death but without the means of that revelation, you're void of the wisdom of that life, the God-designed life and the power of the God-designed life. Somebody said hallelujah. It is foolishness to the Greek while on the tree is a stumbling block to the Jew. Let me show you why it's a stumbling block. In Deuteronomy chapter 21 and 23, the rules given by Moses before Jesus is crucified, right? I'm going to show you why he's a stumbling block. Before Jesus is crucified, he comes to the Jew. Are you hearing me? And he reveals himself to Moses. But to the rest, he's not. Are you hearing me? God revealed himself to the person of Moses. Otherwise, he would not have refused to be called the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. And the Bible tells us he esteems, he takes highly, he exalts highly the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He saw Christ. Moses knew Christ. So, what is what happens? Moses, who knows Christ, they, the Jews, don't know Christ. So God uses Moses, Jesus agrees with Moses to take people to where they must receive Christ. That is why the Bible says that the law, which then is the face of Moses, was the schoolmaster that led us to Christ, isn't it? Moses knew. Moses was the kind who could give the law to the children of Israel and then he tells Jesus, who saw, like he, he winks his eye and like, I've done my part, eh? so this is where the law is going to prove all men under sin because by the law no man of flesh shall be justified. It will bring the end of all human ability and the consequence of that shall be that all of them shall seek for a savior and a righteousness without works and when that comes in, that's when you Christ come in. For I become the end of the law, and you become the beginning and life of righteousness upon all of them that believe. Deal, deal, they've agreed. So Moses is not contrary to the Christ. Moses is the fulfillment of Christ. For in Christ, the Bible says, is the fulfillment of the law. Somebody shout hallelujah. So Moses and Christ are wonderful. That's why Jesus later says, and beginning from Moses and the prophet, he expounded the things concerning himself. Beginning at Moses. So Moses was not a man under the law, and I've showed that to you before. But he was a man who gave the law. He was the giver of the law. He was not the man under the law. He was the giver of the law. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, you're going to love this. So during that time, Laws, ordinances are coming through, uh, provisos, what lawyers call them, I don't know. The things are coming, rules and regulations are coming through. And then, somehow, through this whole legalistic system, God, through his man, they start to, you know, the children of Israel have come from Egypt. You understand? They are getting into the promised land. And Moses is laboring to make them a nation. And they've been enslaved for hundreds of years. They no longer even carry the identity of a nation. They don't know what it means to, 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 to not eat the right food, but carry sovereignty and respect and pride as a nation. They would rather go back to Egypt and eat the melons, the leeks, the onions, and garlic because they think they got to a level where victory, where glory, where sovereignty, where pride, where identity was in fish cucumbers, melon, leeks, onions, and garlic. When a man gets to a level where his testimony is about food, that man does not know God yet. But, but you see, that, that's where they were at. So he has to get into their mindset and change their mentality 
from onions, leeks, garlics and cucumber and melons and fish to make them understand that it's, you, you're a nation, let us become a nation. And then they start to build rules and regulations like Bibles, indeed, the life of the Word of God, we suppose that he's the shepherd of all human civilization. Anyway, so in there, rules are thrown to build nations, conditions and what. Now, Deuteronomy 21 and verses 22, he says, if a man, listen, has committed a sin worthy of death. Did you hear that? And he be put to death. You shall hang him on a tree. Anybody on a tree means he has committed a sin worthy of death. Are you hearing me? And the next verse says, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that hung, or he that is hung, is a cast of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. That means, if a man is hung, the, firstly, if he has committed a, a sin that is worthy of death, hang him on a tree. But if you hang that man on a tree, do not leave him on the tree all through the whole night. No, 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 no. You shall by all means bury him that day. For any man that is hung on the tree is a cast of God. Why is Jesus a stumbling block to the Jew? Because when they see him on the tree, they look at him as one a cast. They look at him as one who is cast by God. That's why he's a stumbling block to the Jew. Because the Jew seeks a sign for God. And in seeking the sign for God, the Jew can look and say, mm -mm, this guy is a cast. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, any man found on the tree is cast of God. If we are looking for a sign, he's a stumbling block. What was he teaching? What was he doing all his life? To both deserve death, but also to be cast by God. How would you even connect, touch, or relate? to a man cast by God. Many people don't know that when Christ is on the cross, many of them that knew Deuteronomy were looking at a cast man by God. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, we considered him smite and stricken and afflicted of God. When you looked at Jesus, you, you were so a man born of sorrows and grief. We did esteem him. We, we thought in the flesh and in the old nature, men thought that he was stricken, he was smitten of God and afflicted. Why? Because cast is he that hangeth on a tree. Did you hear that? Cast is everyone that hangs on a tree. And the Son of God is on the tree. That's a stumbling block to the Jew. Because the Jew looks at him as a curse and the embodiment of curses, generational curses, funny old curses. Every curse is on that man. How can he be on a tree? That day they hung three men. That day they hung three men. And all of them deserved death. And in there again, for God to hide the mystery father, there were three. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so the Bible tells us the reason why you bury him is because you don't want your land to be defiled. That man was so accursed eh, that if he slept on that tree, that whole land will be cursed. So when they were crucifying Jesus that day, I want you to see the mentality in many of the people around him. They are remembering the Deuteronomy. They can even quote it. The Pharisees pulling his beard like, Praise God. Praise God. And here is the mystery. Galatians chapter 3 verses 13. <laughs> First shout before I even read it. Now, those of you shouted it in ignorance, let me give you the knowledge. Paul comes back to Galatians. And he says, you remember that cat on the tree? Hey, 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 hey. Now, he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us 
So it is written, quoted in Deuteronomy again, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Who has understood the wisdom and power of God? Eh? The wisdom of God is, we need to get curses off men. We need men to walk cast free, castless, with no curse with no generational caste, with no family caste, the caste of your judge, the caste of the judge, grandfather's grandfather, the one which went to your father's father, who killed the other man, and then the extended family, all of it got the caste, because they went into witchcraft, and then committed and dedicated all of you to the witch doctor, and so because all of you are under witchcraft, therefore there is a caste on you, and your generations, generations, all of you will die early because the father died. Oh, 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 the man sees a tree, hallelujah, and what does he do? He goes on that tree. What is he thinking? That in 2018, Rebecca Grace should not carry a cast. Anita should not walk with a cast. Irene would not speak a cast story. Trevor and Rita, Rogers and Robert, they will not say that I have a cast on me because of the law. And what does he do? They crucify him. Poor, 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 poor. That's why in the New Testament, there are only two places the word curse is mentioned. The first one is when Paul says, if any man preach a gospel different from this gospel, let him be a curse. He says, though we, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. And the next verse says, he repeated it, as we say therefore, so I say now again, so you understand how serious. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be a cast. The second time the cast is mentioned, it's in Galatians. When it tells you and I that God has redeemed us from the cast which was of the law, because the law was the reason why men talk about curses, generational curses. Why? Because every curse was as a result of a man sinning, isn't it? Every curse was as a result of a man's sin, isn't it? Now, Jesus has redeemed you and I from the curse of the law, being made a curse. I love the language from the cast being made our cast. He redeemed you from the cast being made our cast. He was made a cast. So he redeemed you from the cast because he was made our cast. He could not have redeemed you from the cast until he became our cast. That's the very reason why you cannot be cast. Because your master became a cast and redeemed you from the cast. That is why the Bible calls him the high priest of good things to come. Woo! I don't expect anything funny from God. Ladies and gentlemen, you are under no curse. The curses of your generation, your generation's generation, fire! The curses of your sister's sister, who ate sister's 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 food, fire! The curses of your uncle's uncle, who ate the sister's auntie's tire, fire! Fire the curses of that man who did this to you and then he cast you and from that day you have never got any fa ma money. Fire! Fire! Christ has redeemed you from the curse being made a curse. Listen, in this ministry you've seen me casting out devils. But I do it because some people need it. Why? They might die before they come to this knowledge. 
And we don't want somebody to die in the process. You know some people, they become so decide that they forget that some people need to be what? Sometimes we have to get into your natural mind. Even Paul says, because of your natural nature, I speak to you this way. You understand? You have to become all things. Paul says to them that are under the law, as one under the law. I don't mean that I'm under the law, but if you come with a generational curse, and you're sure it's on you. In Shikuba, I release fire on it. Then you roll on the floor, then you become dirty, you put back your wig. Hallelujah. And then after that, I tell you, by the way, you didn't have to carry that curse because Christ has become our curse for you. So you realize that what you are carrying, you did not need to what? Nayang have also rolled you a bit. Because you carried it, why did you carry it? You understand? I roll you a bit, the wig falls off, you wake up. <laughs> Listen. When the Bible says that a causeless cast will not alight, it means unless there is a cause, there is no cast that will happen. And God has given you the cause, Christ. You don't have a generational curse. I have seen families where fathers have diabetes, daughters get diabetes, daughters, daughters get diabetes. That's the sign of a curse. It's up to you to refuse it. But if you want to roll, I can also give you some. Some little power and you roll. You understand what I'm saying? I've seen generations where great-grandfathers failed in marriage, parents failed in marriage, children are failing in marriage, and their great-grandchildren are failing in marriage. That's the sign of a curse. But you can refuse it. I've seen generations of people lose loses money, next generation loses money, then generation loses money. I've seen generations, families of people. There's some two people I know in this ministry. Some fellows sent witchcraft to their household, a curse on them. And one guy got an accident. This guy, somebody sent a curse on them, and the guy gets an accident. Are you hearing me? And when he gets an accident, he loses his leg, and they cut it to half. Three months later, his brother in a different car also gets a similar accident and they also cut the same side of leg by the same height. There are two brothers walking without left legs. The devil is a liar. I say the devil is a liar. How many are going to lose their feet? How many are going to have accident issues? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? And some stories, I hear stories of people and I'm like, this is a of a curse on that household. But here is the good news. He's not going to redeem you. He has redeemed you. Even when we pray for you, we are praying for the manifestation of all the finished work. You were not set free the day you saw the manifestation. You were set free when the man went on the cross and said, It is finished. Hallelujah. I've seen people switch destinies of people. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen people get witchcraft out of their household. One time I was praying for a family. This woman had witchcraft and then went to a witch doctor and the witch doctor told her, you know what, send it to another family. And everything that was happening in her household on all her children, it shifted into another woman's household. And her children were made right. When we prayed with these people, and they immediately delivered the household received back the stuff i didn't send it back it was not intended to be sent back but when we cast out devils out of that household the same sign shifted from that house and then came back to this house you saw diabetes you saw high blood pressure you're expecting it you enter a doctor's office and they ask you in your family are there people who suffer from this? And then you say, yes. Oh God, how can you say that? How can you say that? It doesn't matter whether your father had this or your mother had this. You say no. Why? Because you entered another family. You are coming to Zion, the city of God, to the company of innumerable angels, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. You are under another family now. 
You say no. Do you have history of heart disease? No. Why? Because Paul didn't die of heart disease. Jesus didn't have heart disease. Isaiah didn't have heart disease. Jeremiah didn't have heart disease. Ezekiel didn't have heart disease. David didn't have it. Hey, I saw Karaba so teleba. He says that covenant speaks better things. Come on, get to your feet and start to speak. Break, refuse and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I am under no curse. I refuse any form and nature because Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. I'm not establishing a new idea. I'm simply claiming what is mine. I will not die. There are people here. You come from families that are dying early. Refuse and die. Jesus, you're my friend forever. For who saw the sunset tree? Who saw the sunset tree? The Bible says he is free indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Somebody say in the name of Jesus, I will live a long life. Say in the name of Jesus, I will live a long life. I will see my children. I'll see my children's children. I'll see my children's children's children. I will not die. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a mighty hand up for praise. Come on, clap your hands to Jesus. Clap your hands to Jesus. Clap your hands to Jesus. If you're here, and you've never given your life to Christ and you feel that you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior and you want to receive him today repeat this as after me say Jesus I believe that you died and rose again for me today I receive you as my Lord and Savior, I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.